What's going on, everybody? This is Living in Arizona Now, and today we're going to make a video about things that you should know before moving to Arizona. It can also uh, be very relevant to people who are living here now and have been here for many years or whatever the case may be, because the information that's provided is going to be some unique facts also that you might not have known, uh, some unique laws that we've talked about previously. But uh, we're going to go through a bunch of different things here and talk about the things that you should know. So whether you're a local or someone looking to move here, you're probably going to find use in this video. So the very first thing you need to know before moving to Arizona is picking the right place to live because the climate varies. A lot of people moving here don't realize we get snow. We get snow in places like the White Mountains. We get snow in Flagstaff. We get snow in Sedona. Even the mountains around Phoenix get snow. But with that being said, Phoenix is also the hottest big city in the country. It's very hot here. In the summertime, in July, early August, it can get up into 118 degrees. It'll hover around 112 to 118. For those of you who've already been here for one of those summers, you can attest to it. By the way, guys, how's it coming in? I think I need to move the microphone a little bit closer. You guys hear me loud and clear or was the uh, microphone too far away? My apologies for that. <laughs> If you guys can hear me now, please smash the likes. All right. So I wanted to get back on subject now. So choosing your location is very important. Also, take into consideration certain weather uh, phenomena like monsoon season. Monsoon season happens from, they say June to September, but I would really say it's more like late July until September. You maybe get an occasional storm in June. But I don't know why they say that. But the thing with that is it brings heavy rains, which lead to flash floods. And flash floods can be a problem uh, if you're trying to cross roads. I mean, it goes without saying what a flash flood can do. But basically, a flash flood is a wall of water that just comes rushing down a wash or a creek. Uh, you know, and it can basically wipe you out. And people get swept away, especially up if you're up in the higher elevations uh, in the mountains. Those those uh, those rivers, washes, they really get going. But the big thing I think is what it can do with the wind. The wind can really knock out people's backyards. It can take roofs off your awning, your patio. So people don't realize that we get this kind of microburst in Arizona. So they don't really take, take into consideration when a monsoon's coming in, they don't tuck the umbrella. But let's just put it like this. I got caught off guard. I was out of my house. I was north and my umbrella flew out of my yard <laughs> because I, I had just left it open, you know, because when you're in your backyard, you want to leave open your umbrella uh, because when you go out there and then, you know, next thing you know, a big storm's rolling in. You don't expect it because it's hard to predict that kind of weather. And it flew out of my yard and I never saw it again. Like it flew away. It took off because of heavy wind from a monsoon. So I think climate and choosing the location uh, based on that climate is something to take into consideration, but also pricing, where the affordable areas are, where the convenient areas are. You don't want to end up in the wrong side of town, especially if you're buying. So before you move here, I wouldn't recommend just moving from Pennsylvania or moving from California and buying right away unless you already have a pretty good working knowledge of Arizona. You've watched this channel probably, so you've got this information. You've probably watched some other channels. You've probably done some research with the a real estate agent, but even then, you still don't know how it's going to feel for you once you're actually in the situation. By the way, let me say what's up to some of the people here. Um, so who do we got? We got Flyman, we got Maggie, we got Debbie, uh, Firefly. What's going on, Firefly? He's always on here. We got Lewis. How's it going? Hampson saying crush up the likes. Yeah, if you're out there, just sound off. Let me know who's out there. I, I like to see uh, who we get in the audience, some of the uh, usual people, which are always good to see because they're like my friends. Every time we do a live feed, they're here. We got Tisha. All right. So some more information that you need to know. Budget for utilities. Take into consideration that your uh, electric bill is going to be a lot higher in the summertime. Straight up from May until October, your electric bill is going to be really high. And, you know, you might want to make up for that in the wintertime by not running any sort of AC, just so you can kind of balance it out and you have like a running average, you know, a dollar cost average, as you would say. Okay, so the next thing we're going to talk about is the uh, effect it's going to have on your body. Something that a lot of people that move here don't take into consideration is allergies. 
I know that around, I would say about February, March, April, May, allergies are quite bad here. I don't know if anyone in the audience has dealt with allergies, but for me, I have some of the, the workarounds for dealing with allergies is getting local honey. So not honey from Oregon down here in Arizona, but locally sourced honey because they're pollinators and that can help get your body's immune system used to the allergies. There's other hacks that you may get, but you know, if you go to uh, any corner store, uh, you know, block corner store, whether wherever it is in those shopping centers, you'll always see there's like a natural path medical center. And one of the things they always have on there for a uh, service is allergy relief. And I don't remember allergies being a big thing about in the 90s. It seemed like it's something that's new here. I don't know if it's a new plant that's being introduced. Some people say maybe it's the bougainvillea. Some people say it's the Palo Verde, the mesquite. Uh, but I don't know. I, I never really had allergies in the 90s. Neither did my dad. And my dad's been living here for like all his life and he's in his 60s. Uh, but he recently started getting allergies. So this is something that's kind of newly popped up for me and him. Uh, but I remember growing up, there was always people that had it. You know, some people say it could be from other reasons. Who knows? But uh, allergies are definitely something to take into consideration. But also uh, dry air, uh, it can lead to bloody noses for some people. Uh, people don't take this into consideration because the air is so dry. You'll wake up in the mornings with a dry mouth and that can be really annoying. So how do you stay hydrated? Going to that idea, the physical effects. How do you stay hydrated? Some people get a humidifier in their room and they might even have two. <laughs> I have two in my room. I haven't really been running them, but I do every day get dry mouth uh, when I'm here. When I'm obviously in a tropical place, I don't have that problem. So because of the dry air, you know, the allergies, that's when you can start getting some bloody noses. And those are not convenient. I don't know who gets these problems, but hey, you know, I'm just putting this out there because some people might not have this problem where they're at and then they get here and they're like, hey, that's new. Thanks to the 23 people who smashed up the likes, by the way. What's going on, AJ? Um, we got Maggie. We got John Sweet. Hey, John, I saw you on the last uh, chat when I rewatched it. I was like, John was saying a bunch of stuff and I, I didn't quite get a response. So I apologize for that. It was just um, sometimes I'm paying attention to the video. I don't see all the chats, but John, I did definitely see that you were making some valid points uh, last video. So another thing is educate yourself on the laws. So one thing that's come up, especially for newbies, is how the traffic works out here. The signs, they're not always the easiest. I think when you live here, you finally get it. You're like, okay, the, the signs finally make sense, the highways and everything. But we get a lot of, we don't get a lot, but we have these unfortunate situations where people do wrong way driving. Uh, and sometimes that has to do with because they're taking a prescription pill, so they're a little bit flighty, they're not paying attention, they're getting on an off-ramp, going in the wrong direction, and that's just horrible. That's just terrible because, you know, that's when really not good things happen. So uh, that doesn't have to do with the laws, but that's something about tr understanding the traffic signs and stuff. When it comes to laws, I'll tell you about some of the unique ones that uh, kind of catch people off guard. Cutting down a swirl cactus. So someone might move into Arizona and they'll be like, hmm, that cactus, <laughs> what is that cactus? Uh, why is it there? It doesn't, it, I, I don't want that cactus there. It might pop your football, it might pop your soccer ball, your basketball, who knows? But someone will go in the backyard and they'll be like cutting down a, a saguaro cactus. Not to be confused with a barrel cactus or any other cactus, but a saguaro cactus. It is illegal to cut one down, uproot saguaro cactus without a permit. So you need to actually... <laughs> Uh, call a professional if you want to move that because you're going to require a permit. They're going to have to rehome that swirl. Swirls are the state flower, but it's more than just a state flower. It's a very unique cactus that only really grows here in Arizona. I think they say they have them in Chile also. But some other laws that you can't do, some people this might apply to. Fishing with dynamite, don't do it. Um, <laughs> I know that's not for everyone, but then they have some unique ones that probably don't apply, like wearing a red bandana in Nogales is illegal, you know, some people might wear a red bandana, but Arizona, it's illegal. And then you have some old outdated laws that are just fun to know, like no shooting camels. You guys might know about Camelback Mountain. And one of the reasons why you'll hear this thing about camels, but you go around Arizona and you're like, there's no real camels out here. There used to be because it's like a era, 
Arabic desert, like the Sahara Desert. They had this idea to bring camels out here, but it didn't last long. And, you know, <laughs> that, that's why a lot of the things go back to camels, but it's no longer uh, relevant here because we don't have camels. You don't see them in the wild, but you do see donkeys. They have this law about donkeys in a bathtub. But one thing that's not really a law, but something you should know is Arizona is one of the only states, I think it's the only state that does not observe daylight savings time, which to me is great. So the, the daylight savings time thing does not apply here. Thank goodness, right? So now let's talk about um, some activities that people are into when they get here. Uh, outdoor activities like off-roading, going off into the desert, going to the lakes, so boat culture, getting a jet ski, getting a boat, going out to Saguaro Lake, going to Canyon Lake, Lake Pleasant, even Havasu, or, you know, there's so many lakes out there. There's Roosevelt, there's Apache Lake, um, there's Bartlett Lake, Horseshoe Lake. Uh, even up in the northern part of Arizona, there's many lakes like Lynx Lake up in Prescott. You know, I could go on and on about lakes. We've actually made a full video about the best lakes in Arizona, if you guys want to see that. There's a couple nice lakes up there on the Mogollon Rim. There's a lot of good lakes in Arizona, but uh, that's big thing for uh, outdoor activities is boating, especially in the summertime. I mean, you want to be on the water, right? But also there's a lot of hiking, especially in Arizona, uh, Phoenix. Uh, you know, you've got so many different hikes around the superstitions. You've got them around Camelback Mountain, Northern Phoenix, and then going up into places like uh, hiking San Francisco Peak, Mount Lemon in Tucson, Catalina Foothills. Got a lot of hikes. So hiking is a big thing. And then concerts. We get Country Thunder. Uh, you know, there's we. I would say the concert season is usually fall or spring. And spring and fall is the best time to be in Arizona. The winter time, it seems like it kind of cools down just because of Christmas and the new year. But then everything picks up around spring. And all the good activities are in springtime. That's something you should probably know. Even up north, you know, springtime, everyone's just coming to life, right? Um, another thing is, Altitudes change. You know, you could be at a low-lying altitude in the Valley of the Sun, Phoenix or Tucson, but then you go up into the foothills, the chaparral areas, and then the next thing you know, you're in a higher elevation, which is going to make you short for breath and all that stuff. I mean, you go up to Flagstaff, you can get shortness of breath. You hike up, you go up to Snow Bowl, something like that. Um, it, it's it's real. The altitude change. Let me see who's out there. So we've got 29 people smashing up the likes. Um, Alan says people cannot drive here. Yeah, that's a thing. I mean, you have to take into consideration, uh, driving out here is, I saw this one meme where people were, they basically took a caption of Mel Gibson. You remember that movie Mad Max? And they took like the, the, the screenshot of Mad Max with the tanks and all these crazy all-terrain vehicles and people with like guns. And they say that's us 60 highway us 60. And then they did another one, which was like, uh, like F Formula One or NASCAR on 101. So, I mean, you know, you get on those highways. LA's got some crazy highways. I haven't really seen crazy highways like that on the East Coast. Houston has like the craziest highways, but they're always traffic jammed, like full with gridlock. But the reason I say Houston is because I think they're like seven lane highways going in each direction. So it's like seven lanes going south, seven lanes going north, total of 14 lanes. We don't have any seven lane highways here. Maybe there's six lanes. I don't know. Someone who's been to Houston, you guys know what I'm talking about. Because Texas is really unique. They have uh, toll roads. We don't have toll roads here. That's a good thing, right? I know you guys like that one. That's that's a big thing because some states still do toll roads. And in Texas, if you drive on a toll road and you don't have a proper permit or a proper license, they'll give you a ticket in the mail. I actually went to Texas and I was driving on a toll road. I was like, oh, man, I was just waiting for like the next three months for them to send me something in the mail because I, I thought that I used it without paying or something. Thankfully, it never came. I don't know. I mean, Texas is like that. But Arizona, you don't have to worry about toll roads. Um, someone said Cardinals 49ers game is coming. Should be a very busy week for that. Yeah. I mean, it'd be a lot better if Cardinals were competitive. Uh, but obviously, the uh, someone's, at the someone's at my door. It's the... Uh, DoorDash. Hopefully that person doesn't keep knocking. <laughs> Some of those guys, when they deliver, they just keep knocking on my door. I'm like, dude, I'm good. Please don't do that. <laughs> Let's see here. Uh, someone said, if backwards Arizona had clover leaf on and off ramps, wrong way drivers would be reduced by 90%. A lot of the wrong way drivers are because of impairment, though. 
Uh, impairment's been a big thing in Arizona for many years, going back to even the years of Joe Arpaio when he did the pink underwear and the pink, uh, you guys remember that when he made everyone who got a DUI go to Tent City for 14 days and uh, wear pink? Who remembers that? That was crazy. Um, I'm saying it was crazy because that really happened. Like, you don't, that's, that's something that's almost so unfathomable that it actually happened. It really did. Um, someone said Seattle tolls are really bad. Yeah. I mean, so Arizona not having tolls shout out to Arizona for that one. Right. We can, we can give them a good thing. Now let's talk about Arizona history. So what's some unique Arizona history that you should probably, uh, you know, that you'll want to know about? Well, some of the things that, uh, I find to be interesting is Arizona is has its birthday on February 14th and it wasn't actually a state until 1912. So it was like the 48th or the 49th state. I remember exactly, but there's an interesting history because this used to belong to Mexico and it was a part of the Gadsden purchase. So it was Mexico ownership. It was owned by Spain. So when, uh, you know, you're, you technically live in old Mexico right here. Let's just say that, you know, New Mexico right next door also. Uh, so that all kind of came into the United States hands after the battle of, I think it was, what was the battle of Veracruz? No, uh, Mexico American war, as you guys know, uh, that was a big war. And, um, what came after that was, uh, the California gold rush because California also used to be part of Mexico. But a lot of people, they don't realize that. They just think it's the United States. It's always been the United States. But no, up until uh, <laughs> around about 1848, it was part of, by the way, I'll say this. You guys know why they're called the San Francisco 49ers, right? Because in 1849 was the California gold rush. So they're the 1849ers. A lot of people don't know that, although that's not Arizona history. But it applies because this whole area used to be all old Mexico. Uh Another thing is the uh, the the capital built the capital of Arizona is Phoenix, so you can go down there and see the beautiful copper rooftop at the capital. I I forget the street, but I know it's I want to say Osborne. No, oh man, sometimes I just draw blank. But nearby Wesley Bolin Plaza. Uh, anyway, <laughs> someone help me out. What what's the name of the road where the capital is? I've forgotten already. I just know if you go to if you go to the central, you go uh, east, no west. You go into the Av side. It's it's by the west side. And if you've never been to the Capitol building, go down there. Go check it out. Go walk around. It's beautiful, but you can't really go in anywhere there. You have metal detectors and stuff, but it's still a nice little area to walk around, take a picture, and be like, hey, I went to the Arizona State Capitol building. And I think they said Jefferson, Van Buren. Okay, there you go. But you guys, I've been there a couple of times. It's a nice place to take a picture. It's got a big copper copper roof. So if you've never been to the Capitol building, it's something to do, right? It's, some, it's, it's an activity. It's a beautiful time of year to go down there. That whole neighborhood around there is also very nice. They have big homes. Those are like the old classic Ranchero style. Uh, now they're like Victorian style. It's very green and lush in that neighborhood around the Capitol. Uh, you'd be surprised. You'd be like, wow, I didn't know these big trees grew in the desert. I mean, if you look at what Phoenix looked like, before they turned it green or turned it, it was total desert, flat, you know, nothing really grew down here. We actually have another bit of history that's important to know about the uh, Ho'okam people. So you have a, a variety of different uh, indigenous peoples who lived here, but the Ho'okam are the people who created the canal system that we copied, the modern society copied. Well, I would say it was actually the Mormons who took the Salt River and kind of started diverting it and they built Mesa. And the reason they call it Mesa is because when they were going down to Lehigh, if you go down to the Salt River, you'll see there's a place called Lehigh. There's also a Lehigh in um, Utah. <laughs> but Lehigh is like a Mormon name, is an establishment. And uh, they would say, where are you going? I'm going up on La Mesa. La Mesa. La Mesa is the table, the flat. So that's how Mesa got its name, because it's the flat land up above the Salt River. But down there, you'll see the... That, that's where a lot of the canal system is in Mesa. And it's uh, basically copied the canal system that the Ho'okam people had in place, I think like maybe like 700 years ago, maybe even longer than that. But after the Ho'okam, they disappeared. No one knows where the Ho'okam went. Then you had like the Apache Indians here. 
Uh, so the Apaches, that's why if you go up towards like superstitions and stuff, you'll see the Apache Trail, uh, Apache Junction. You'll see a lot of different uh, Apache things, right? And if you go back up into the Apache Trail, you'll see that Tano National Desert or National Forest, as they call it. It's more like a national desert, really. But it's a chaparral. That's where they were living. And that's some rugged, rugged, rugged terrain. And Apaches, they were very fierce uh, when it came to defending themselves. And some of their leaders that are from Arizona that are very famous, you have Cochise, you have Geronimo. Um, you know, so you can kind of research the history about Geronimo and Cochise. I think there's a couple others, but there's even a golf course up in Desert Mountain, uh, North Phoenix, Scottsdale, I should say, where they named a lot of the golf courses, Apache, Cochise, Geronimo, um, uh, Renegade. That's another golf course. So, yeah, people saying Lehigh Acres Flat. Yeah, but if you go down to the Salt River right there, there's a monument for when the Mormons arrived here doing the uh, canal system. But the reason they call it Roosevelt Lake is because Roosevelt, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, Teddy Roosevelt was the one who commissioned the dam system that you have that begins basically Roosevelt Dam. You have the Apache Dam, you have the Canyon Lake Dam, and then you have the Saguaro Lake Dam, which is the SRP. And he basically said there will be a great civilization down there in the valley. He was talking about the Valley of the Sun. So a lot of our history goes back to Teddy Roosevelt, but that's why it's called Roosevelt Lake. And then you have Calvin Coolidge, who's also got a dam named after him. And he also has a city in Southeast Phoenix or South, yeah, Southeast Phoenix called Coolidge. And that's named after Calvin Coolidge as well. The interesting thing about Florence, it's along the Gila River. Okay. Now the Gila River was a main tributary that used to pour into Phoenix and it would meet with the Salt River in Buckeye. And so Buckeye, now it's all dry. There's nothing out in Buckeye, but the Salt River, the Gila River, the Agua Fria, and the Verde River, well, actually the Verde River meets the Salt River out there by Fort McDowell. You can actually see where the Verde River comes in and meets the salt, but that's up above the, the, the dam right there. But it all used to come together right there in Buckeye. So Buckeye is a very fertile place. You'll notice there's a lot of farms out there because all the sedimentation from years of just uh, rivers flowing through Buckeye uh, meeting right there and then eventually going down to the Colorado. But the interesting thing about Florence was they used to have tugboats, kind of like you'd see in the Mississippi River, going up and down Florence. So when you go down to Florence, Arizona, which is right next to Coolidge or past Santan Valley. It's actually considered like the safest place in Arizona. They're actually building it up. It's like an up and coming place again. But you go down there, there's like an old town and it goes right towards the river. And you'll see the big wide Gila River right there is like dry. It's like totally dry. <laughs> but it used to be so big and powerful and running that it had uh, tugboats going up and down there. Now, I one time had a dream. I'm not trying to be all like, prophetic or anything, but I did literally have a dream out of nowhere about 10 years ago that you could take a boat from Phoenix down to uh, the Sea of Cortez, that there was boats going up and down. And I was like, that's weird. I don't think that's, that's, that's not possible. And I, and I, and then I found out like a few years later that actually there was a major river. The Salt River used to go all the way down into the Colorado River before they dammed it all up. And I was like, that's a weird dream to have. <laughs> Wouldn't that be cool, though, if you could take a boat from Phoenix down to the Sea of Cortez? That'd be awesome. That'd be so cool. Um, Arizona history, Tombstone Bisbee. So, yeah, you guys know about the history with Tombstone. You guys have probably seen the movie, Doc Holliday, Wyatt Earp. You have Big Nose Kate. If you haven't gone down to Tombstone, you can go down there and watch the OK Corral shootout. They say that's not actually where the OK Corral shootout happened. Thanks to the 69 people who smashed up the likes, by the way. Uh, it's because of you. We'll keep this thing going. And, uh, but yeah, the OK Corral, that was not where it actually is. But the cool thing about going down to uh, Tombstone, you have the Tombstone Cemetery. I forget what it's called, Bootleg Cemetery, maybe. And then you have the largest rose bush in the world. Hey, that's cool, right? Largest rose bush. I think it's at the birdcage or nearby the birdcage. Um, but yeah, t Tombstone, in my opinion, I'm surprised more people don't live there. It's got the, one of the best climates. I mean, it's a very green place. It sits up above a, like a river valley. As you guys know, the big ticket in town for Tombstone was silver. There's a lot of 
silver mining activity. But if you go just down the road a bit, again, a day trip, you can easily do Tombstone and Bisbee in the same trip. You go down to Bisbee and Bisbee, Old Phelps Dodge. They used to, they were the ones who built it. They even had a baseball team, like a professional baseball team in like 1918. That's how popular Bisbee was. Bisbee was bigger than, than Phoenix. <laughs> so uh, Tombstone was bigger than Phoenix. Prescott was the capital before it was Phoenix. So there's a lot of information about the, the history. Boot Hill, yeah. I mean, I don't know. If you guys want, I can keep giving you more history if history is interesting. But I don't know. A lot of people I've noticed that when you start talking to them about history, they're kind of like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, whatever. They want to hear about Kim Kardashian. They want to hear about uh, the next cool thing. But when you start talking to them about Arizona history or something, some people get really interested. And then, like, some people are like, why do I need to know this? <laughs> anyway, so um, someone says, is... Is good Tempe for 25-year-old guy? Yeah. Why would Tempe not be good for it? If I was 25 years old, I would say, yeah, Tempe is where you want to be. I mean, if you're 40 like me, I would say you want to be in a place like uh, Awatuki, which is nearby Tempe. It's close enough, but it's not quite. You get all the accessibility to Tempe, but you don't have the uh, the ruckus that Tempe brings with it. And you get a, a bit newer community. Mark says, Sholo has four season climate, um, 6,000 feet elevation. Yeah, if you go up above Sholo, you even come up into Pine Top Lakeside. It's even higher up there. They have like a couple lakes, a lot of cabins. Oh, man, if you could get a cabin, a summer home up in uh, Sholo, or, uh, Pine Top Lakeside, man, that's where you want to be. I love history you're telling us, says Carolyn. Your history knowledge of Arizona is impressive. Thank you, Thomas. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of history about Arizona I could go on and on about. Um, but I, I think the the way the uh, SRP set up Salt River Project, how it was commissioned by Teddy Roosevelt, that's an important thing. But another thing you should know is we have water scarcity here. Even though Teddy Roosevelt gave us that uh, SRP and Colorado River Project from Herbert Hoover, Hoover Dam, <laughs> you know, uh, and then you have uh, Lake Havasu, Parker Dam, all that, you know. Those are those are big projects. It's shared with California and Nevada, but you guys get the idea. Uh, yes, your history of Arizona is really good, Jeff. Are you born and raised in Arizona? Yeah, I'm born and raised here. My dad used to take us all around Arizona. We used to go camping. We used to go fishing in uh, like we used to go fishing at the Verde. I don't see anyone really fishing in the Verde, but when I was a kid, we'd camp at the Verde and fish at the Verde right up there. I think past uh, nearby Rio Verde, we would sometimes go, but then we'd go up towards like Horseshoe Dam, up above Horseshoe Dam. You have Sheep's Bridge and stuff. Uh, even down south of the uh, Bartlett Lake, you you know, you can do some fishing, but if you fish right there at the dam where Bartlett is, you'll catch a bunch of sunfish. <laughs> and we used to go fishing and we'd catch a bunch of sunfish as a little kid. I'd always be like, oh, sunfish. And then you put them on the barbecue and you eat them. They kind of got a lot of bones, but they taste really good. You put some uh, pepper on it and, and lemon. There you go. <laughs> put it in some tinfoil with a, with a potato. You wrap that in tinfoil and you put it in the fire. And that's, that's what you would eat. That's what we would eat as kids. You know, it's like, that's the staple of the Arizona diet, a potato and a fish, uh, sunfish. I never really liked catfish, but they got big catfish in Bartlett. I've heard stories about big bass. I've heard stories about big catfish. I mean, it'd be cool if, uh, you know, you could see what the biggest fish ever pulled out of one of these Arizona lakes was. So, one, some of you guys probably know. Um, but, yeah, Michael says Prescott has some good lakes for fishing. It really does. The history around Prescott is quite interesting. We actually have a video coming out in the next couple of days. Like real soon, we're going to be doing a full Prescott tour. So be on the lookout for that. We're actually, we have three videos coming soon uh, about cities. And these are all like brand new footage right now from Arizona. Prescott, Sedona, Verde Valley, Jerome, and Clarkdale. And then we have uh, Flagstaff, Winslow. So if you haven't already subscribed or you haven't turned on the bell, do so because all those videos are going to be coming out totally relevant we're going to go into great detail about all three of those areas because a lot of you were saying we only focus on Phoenix. We only focus on Tucson. And we had done a lot of videos about Southern Arizona. And Southern Arizona just doesn't get the respect that it's due. But we're going to go back up into Northern Arizona and show you guys around. And if there's other places in Northern Arizona you want us to film and ping on, we can. 
We recently did, these are videos you can watch right now. We did uh, Bullhead City, Kingman. We did Morency. We did Globe. You can go back onto the channel and watch all those videos. And those are interesting uh, information about other places outside of Phoenix. So you can't really say that this channel only focuses on the mother, the mother city of Phoenix, because I do talk a lot about Phoenix because I'm here, you know, it's the big city. It's really the heart and heart and soul of the state's politics and economy. But beyond that, it's, it's okay. Um, someone said, please don't encourage people to move to Arizona. We have enough people here already. Don't worry, bro. Or, oh no, desert girl. Don't worry. We also have a lot of people leaving. There's a, uh, you know, you have, we have people coming in and we have people going, <laughs> Uh, you know, and, um, it's not about encouraging people to live here. It's about people who are already made up their mind that are living here or going to live here. And we provide information to them. Um, you know, I, there's no possible way that I have enough power and influence to make someone's life decision to say, I'm moving to Arizona. <laughs> this, there's, there's no way that I have that power and influence. It's either they already are considering it. They're looking for information. And that's the only thing I do. It's a news and information resource. And yeah, we try to be as helpful as we can with the information that we provide. But I do agree. It is quite busy on the streets. And that's not necessarily um, a good thing. I agree. I mean, I, I drive around Phoenix and I'm like, it's gotten so busy. It's so crowded. But that has nothing to do with this channel. Phoenix has always grown. I mean, Desert Girl, you, if you're a Desert Girl, you've been here for a long time. I don't know if you're from Mojave County or if you're from, or, you know, I don't know where you're from, <laughs> what desert you're talking about. I assume the Sonoran Desert. But if you're from Phoenix, you know that Phoenix has always been growing. I mean, since the 1970s, Phoenix has been like the fastest growing city every year. Um, so it has nothing to do with this channel. <laughs> That's like say, saying, uh, uh, hey, don't be a real estate agent and sell people houses. Hey, don't work. Don't be an insurance agent and sell people insurance. Hey, don't build houses. Don't drive, you know, you can't really blame anyone for that, for providing a service because that's how the economy works, right? And I get what you're saying, though. It is super busy on the streets. Oh, my gosh. Especially when the snowbirds come into town. It's crazy. It's crazy. I mean, there's so many people on the streets, but um, it is what it is. People are moving here. They've always moved here. If anything, we need to do smart infrastructure. That's my big thing. Smarter infrastructure. Michael says you should do Munns Park near Flagstaff. It's got a lake and really nice hiking area, pretty much nested in the forest. Yes, I know Munns Park. Um, I've actually stayed at a cabin there before. We didn't hit Munns Park in that one. Uh, we did, I, I want to say we went around Walnut Canyon, Meteor Crater. Maybe did a little bit of Sunset Crater around uh, the volcano. You know, that Arizona had a big volcano. If you go around... Uh, San Francisco Peak, Humphreys Peak, that's an old extinct volcano. You're walking around. Um, reason I know about this channel, offered a job in Scottsdale and decided to stay away from the hot weather from Bay Area. Okay, yeah, so you're in the Bay Area, right? Uh, Thomas says, I'm from Italy, moved to Houston in March, and will start my life in Phoenix. Yeah, so I mean, there's a message that most people from Arizona always want me to say. They say, when you come here, wherever you're coming from, uh, you know, <laughs> try not to change anything, I guess is what they're saying, whatever that means. Um, I could go into detail about it, but every time I do, I get the opposition who's trying to change things, always coming at me, attacking me for uh, talking about, because it always goes in the direction of politics. But if you look in the comments, I'll, I'll, I'll give everyone who's got an opinion about that some time to, to vent in the comments right now. So post a comment right there about your message to people who are coming here about what not to change. Because if I go into it, um, you know, then it looks like I'm picking a side. But I hear this comment all the time from people who are saying, if you're gonna move to Arizona, please don't change it. Please do this, please don't do that. And so, I mean, I'll give them a chance to, to vent right there in the comment section. So read those right there from locals who are here. But the big thing is, I mean, before my family moved here, my dad came from Illinois Actually, he lived a little bit in West Virginia. Um, my mom, she came from Australia a uh, long, long time ago. And uh, she moved here when she was seven. She's not as big of an Arizona person as my father is. My dad's like the uh, 
diehard Arizona guy. Like, you can't get my dad out of Arizona. He's up there by Cave Creek, by the way. You can't get that guy to leave Arizona. Even when I was living in Hawaii, I was like, hey, you want to come live out here for a while? Oh, no, no, he's not doing it. He's diehard Arizona. My mom, she don't like the heat. She doesn't like the the really bright sun, the heat. It's just not good for her. So that's something that, you know, is a big difference. Um, but you can see people are making the comments in there. Um, I'm not going to read all of it. Uh, someone said, if you can't avoid moving to Arizona in the middle of summer. Yeah, like the best time to move to Arizona. Well, actually, you might be able to find some good deals in the middle of the summer because so many people leave Arizona, like the snowbirds, like 10% of the population around Phoenix leaves Phoenix. So there's like, it all of a sudden opens up like some rental opportunities or some uh, housing opportunities around like July. So that, it, it, but if you can endure the heat, that's the big caveat because it does get hot. I mean, the last thing you want to be doing to yourself or to a movers is have them in 115 degree heat moving refrigerators upstairs or beds. Although they got to work, I mean, Arizona's 365. I mean, 365 days a year, this this place is moving. <laughs> it's not like we stop. Uh, your dad is in Cave Creek or is, oh no, he, so my grandfather was the one who moved out here. He built a home that my uncle now lives in up there by, uh, kind of nearby Spur Cross. I don't know if you guys know where Spur Cross is, but he was like one of the only first, he was one of the first houses out there, my grandpa. And, uh, he built a house. My other uncle built a house right next to there. He bought the property next to that. And so my uncle and so two uncles were living next to each other. They bought the house for my grandpa. My grandpa moved to Florida. So he got out of Arizona after he moved the family out to Arizona in Cave Creek. They settled in Cave Creek. So they're called Creekers. Well, my grandpa, he had to move because my grandma had emphysema and she couldn't be in the dry weather. So she smoked a lot. So they had to move to a humid climate and they moved to Florida. And um, so that's why my grandpa ended up retiring out in Carabelle, which is on the panhandle. But my dad and all his brother, well, my dad's really the only one of the siblings that stayed here. But uh, stories about my dad, he's a middle child. He, um, when he got, when he was growing up, he like was living out in the desert out there. Cause that was back in the day when you could squat like out there, he was camping in the desert before he had a house. And then he met my mom at one of the, uh, at one of the bars, but he was, he was uh, squatting out in the desert. He was living in the desert literally. So he's a total desert, you know, they call them desert rats, but um, he, he had a house and then he lost it. Then he moved in with his girlfriend in sun city. And then he, he just keeps going back to a, uh, Cave Creek, he, he's built a lot of the, my dad's a mason. He, he does rock, rock work. So if you go up to Cave Creek, you'll see like a lot of like rock work. He's he's one of the primary people who's built all that. He doesn't do so much anymore because he's in his 60s and the heat really does affect him. But he's still trucking along as a construction guy because that's all he knows is masonry. But, you know, if you go up to Spur Cross, you'll see the rock work. My dad did that. You'll see the library up there. He did that rock work, but that's where he works. Uh, desert only makes pulmonary problems worse. Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, that's the thing with the dry air. Um, it can, it has its pros and it has its cons, but uh, a lot of people have an issue with it. Um, too much dust in the valley from construction, says John. Yeah, it's true. I mean, it's not just the it's not just the construction; it's just the lack of rain. I mean, I was looking at the five day forecast, or I was like, when is the next rain? Because I'm out here, you know, I've been here for a few days back, and I haven't seen, when was the last time it rained in Phoenix? Like, you know, I was gone, obviously, making videos with Island Hopper, but I'm looking at the seven-day. I don't see any rain, and here it is in uh, December. If I look at the, is that a 10-day forecast? 10-day forecast, not any rain in December. I mean, that's, we know it doesn't rain very much in the in the summertime. I mean, this summer's uh, monsoon season wasn't that extreme so uh someone said it rained last week for a few or a few weeks ago okay it must have rained while you were gone yeah that's what i'm saying so but i'm saying here's the 10 day forecast i don't know if you guys can see it no rain obviously hopefully they're wrong right like do the rain dance you know go up to uh san francisco peak they do the rain dance still or you know the the tribe they, they have 
you can watch, um, you can go to the reservation and if you're, I think you have to be invited or something, but they do some dancing. Um, you know, you guys seen the kachinas and stuff and all of that. If you're moving here, you need to be respectful and uh, of the indigenous culture, because this is something that pre-exists all, uh, Europeans, uh, or wherever you're from, whether you're from who knows where Asia, Africa, Europe, back East, you got to respect the indigenous uh, culture. And so when you're up in Flagstaff, you'll see uh, you have the opportunity to learn about that. And one of the places that's considered a very sacred place around there in Flagstaff is San Francisco Peak. If you go behind there, you'll see uh, Talakapaki. I call it the Machu Picchu of Arizona. We actually made a video about Talakapaki, um, but it's, it's quite impressive uh, to see how they were living. All the washes and riverbeds that would run off of the um, the uh, San Francisco Peak, Mount Humphreys, dried up. It's dried up now, but um, you it, you make it makes you wonder. Like they they pick that area right there at Talakapaki. Two rivers kind of come together, and that's where they built it. Um, but it's completely dry now. Um, but that's very interesting. Uh, Alice, welcome. Why don't uh, BMAC says, why don't you move to Hawaii? Is this BMAC from uh, um, Lapa Hoi Hoi or uh, Papa Loa? Sorry. Is that, is that B is that the BMAC that I know from uh, Cave Creek? I'm assuming so. Yeah, man. <laughs> nice. He's like, why don't you move? BMAC actually used to live in Cave Creek. I grew up with him in high school. He's a, I think he went dirt bike. He does a lot of things. Now he's like in uh, Hawaii five Oh or something. But um, Michael says, yep. Learned a lot about the local tribes in the Flagstaff area. Walnut Canyon is an awesome place too. Yeah. I mean, Walnut Canyon. And then if you go up towards uh, the four corners area, you have a uh, Canyon de Shea monument Valley. And then you have, uh, if you go beyond that, I, I think they're called, what's the name of that tribe? The Zuni. I think they're called the Zuni. But there's an area that's really amazing up in Colorado. It's called Mesa Verde. And Mesa Verde is probably one of the most well-preserved uh, Native American uh, ruins. I, I hesitate to call it ruins, but, uh, you know, you have Montezuma Castle. Imagine Montezuma's Castle, uh, but times like 10. And that's Mesa Verde. And you can go just past Four Corners up into Colorado, and that's where you'll find Mesa Verde. And uh, so they're talking about Walnut Canyon. That's why I bring that up. It's kind of by the little Colorado. And Dirt, Dirt Racer X says, yeah, Mesa Verde is great. Been there. Yeah. So, if again, you know, if you're bored and you're looking for bucket list things to do, I could give you a whole laundry list of things to do to stay busy weekend trips because you should be doing a weekend trip at least once a month, I would say if not twice a month, but I mean, I think everyone has enough energy, especially if you're in your thirties or forties, then you got kids to show them around Arizona. I know that's what my dad did. He, I mean, I'd say six trips a year and you do six trips a year. You get around to some of these pockets and corners of Arizona that are really impressive. You know, like Southern Arizona, we talk about it. The Chiricahuas going down there, the Chiricahuas where they have Cave Creek and Portal, not the Cave Creek, North of Phoenix. I always have to put that disclaimer out there because there's a Cave Creek in southeastern Arizona, and that's where they actually have the only jaguar in the United States. Why well, I forgot his name, but there's a jaguar down there. They say there's maybe even more, but they've caught him on a wildlife camera. He's still there. He's a Mexican jaguar. So that's kind of El Jefe. That's right. See, Deacon, man, he's always on it. He knows. <laughs> But, dude, that's something I would love to do. If I was in southern Arizona, I would be having, like, wildlife cams set up. And I would just let those suckers run for 30 days on uh, motion sensors. And I would see what's in there. I mean, you know, even if I lived up on the Mogollon Rim, I'd be looking for Sasquatch or Bigfoot or the Mogollon Monster, you know? Uh, the, he, yeah, actually, if you guys look on YouTube for El Jefe, there's a guy from Tucson who does wildlife cams. I think he spotted some unique animals out in like Madera Canyon. Um, we did, we recently did a video about six months ago of Madera Canyon and uh, Tubac and some of that area down there. But that's a cool area to explore. Those are two different trips, though. Chiricahuas and Tubac, Nogales, that's a totally different trip. You can't, 
you could try to do those in one trip, a weekend trip, but it'd be too time crunch and you'd be spending too much time in a car. If you're going from Phoenix, you could easily do it from Tucson. But if you're coming from Phoenix, that's two different trips. And that would like incorporate like um, Tombstone, Bisbee. But if you go, I'm not going to say you got to go to Southwestern Arizona. I'm not saying that's really on a, a, too many people's laundry list to go down to Yuma. Like, <laughs> no. Rocky Point, sure. But Yuma and Rocky Point, not really in the same direction. The only time you might do Yuma is if you went down to San Felipe. So if you want to go to another place aside from Puerto Pernasco in Mexico, you go down to San Felipe because you guys know they just closed the border with Lukeville. Did you guys know about that? Did anyone know about that? So going down to Puerto Pernasco during spring break, Rocky Point might be cut off because they just cut off the Lukeville border. So pay attention to that. Um, what area do I live? I'm out there in Mesa. Someone said, what about the abduction in Heber aliens and Phoenix lights? Okay, the Phoenix lights were basically like some SpaceX stuff, in my opinion. I, You know, the alien stories, I think there's a movie that was made. Someone please help me in the comments with the name of the movie that was made um, about the guy up on, I think he was in Heber Overguard, up there on the Mogollon Rim where he was supposedly abducted. But here's the thing. You don't hear about it anymore, right? You don't hear about abductions. You don't hear about Phoenix Lights. But now when it happens, like a Phoenix Lights type incident, it's everyone's like, oh, did you see the rocket shooting across the sky? Did you see those lights? They're like, yeah, that was SpaceX doing something. So it could have been some like government stuff uh, because, you know, that was also in the area of South Mountain, really. But also they had the Barry Goldwater bombing range down there. I think the Barry Goldwater bombing range is still active. That's another reason why you wouldn't really want to go down to southwestern Arizona, because most of it's bombing range for Barry Goldwater. Um, fire in the sky. That's right. If you guys want to see if you guys want some information on abductions and stuff, check out that movie Fire in the Sky. Um, but, you know, it's all cool to hear about, cool to think about. I mean. When I went up on the Mogollon Rim, uh, last time I was up there, I bumped into some guy who was living out of his car. And he was talking my ear off about all sorts of stuff. <laughs> I mean, he was this guy was going into like he was trying to get me plugged into some like conspiracy theorists about all sorts of things. Uh, but he was talking about everything from alien abductions to I think I brought it up. And he's one of those dudes he, like he doesn't he doesn't really get, use his cell phone. So he's like one of those people who's in the world. He's like. So he just goes around driving around in his in his pickup truck. I wasn't sure if he was like safe to be around, really. I mean, he was like he was a little bit too friendly for a stranger. But um, it was daytime, and I was with my buddy, so I was like, "All right, we'll we'll sit here and listen." But this guy, he like had us follow him down there, and he was like showing us some stuff around the Mogollon Rim. But he kept talking about like alien abductions, and there's some guy on Joe Rogan's podcast. Maybe you guys know his name. I I wish I could remember it. I mean, there's so many things I come across. I can't remember all these names, but there's this guy supposedly who's goes into great detail about the aliens and the programs and all that. Thanks to hundred people who smashed the likes. If you guys get it up to 200 likes, we'll keep going. Um, fire in the guy, fire in the sky guy lives in Sholo. Is that where it happened in Sholo? Um, I don't know. Someone said it's a really bad movie. Yeah. I mean, I don't really watch too much Hollywood stuff anyway. Um, so if you guys want the name of the guy with the trail cam, his name's Jason Miller, says AJ. Thank you, AJ. Uh, so anyway, either way, there's a lot of stuff going on. Uh, Southern Arizona, Northern Arizona, near Overguard. Yeah, Heber Overguard. By the way, Heber Overguard, if you guys go up there, there's some cheap land around there. If you guys want some cheap land, big property, they have it all like parceled off and you can get like acreage in Hebrew Overguard. Now people from Hebrew Overguard probably aren't going to be too happy with me telling you guys that because uh, they probably, they, they like it small town. So when you're going up there to try and check out Hebrew Overguard or try and live in Hebrew Overguard, just be aware. They got locals up there that don't want you to bring any riffraff. You usually have to earn your keep up there. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's not one of those places you just set up there, set up shop there. You bring your uh, San Francisco me mentality and just start uh, kicking back. You kind of got to blend in, if you know what I mean. And really, I'm being serious. I mean, they'll accept you, but it's 
you got to res respect is earned around those parts. Um, uh, you know, there's, there's just old school Arizona guys. I mean, these are people that use fireplaces. I mean, I know that's weird. In the 90s, it was common to use a fireplace. But nowadays, most people, I don't, I don't know, people who live in Phoenix, I don't know anyone who has a fireplace with wood. But up there, cold, harsh winters, uh, unique summers. I mean, they had a flood one year, not necessarily in Hebrew Overgard, but off the, off the way from the uh, White Mountains. I guess it's so much snowpack that when it all melted, it flooded the whole area, like massive flooding. I want to say it was in the 70s. But yeah, they have wood stoves. I mean, you go up there, you'll still see they got wood stoves, fire fireplaces. They you could buy you like go to one of those ranches. They've got like grass-fed free-range beef and you can actually order the beef and have them deliver it to you like once a month and this is the best beef you'll eat. It's real beef. It's none of this um fake stuff. You can even go up there and see the cattle. You'd be like, yep, that cattle right there, he's going to be, you know, you guys get the idea. But anyway, um, I lived under the rim. Nothing ever happened. All talk BS, says Amber. Yeah, I mean, that's a, they, right below the rim, they have Star Valley. The best thing about the rim, you'll see a lot of stars. But as far as all the folklore and all the mythology and all these stories, you know, you never hear about it because it's, it's more than anything, it's like old stories. It could have been going on back then. I'm not going to discredit somebody for being abducted or for bumping into the Mogollon monster. But if it was up there or if it was happening, you'd hear more stories about it. And in this day and age, when you have cell phone, um, you know, you, you have a cell phone in your pocket with a 4K camera, someone would record that. I mean, you know, you have these videos of people supposedly recording Sasquatch and um, Bigfoot, but... It's always debunked. They're like, that's some guy in a suit. <laughs> that's not really Bigfoot. I mean, if Bigfoot really existed, not necessarily here in Arizona, but the Mogollon monster, whatever it is, it's just, it's out of control. Choose a wide street, enough space for three or four vehicles. There you go. My, Mitch says, no, it didn't happen in Sholo, but Walton lives in that area. Right. So he's saying, happened in Sh Overguard, but it's, uh, the guy, the guy from the movie actually lives in Sholo. And there's another place up there that you may be interested in that a lot of people go up there for uh, summer housing, but some people like to live up there during the winter when it snows. It's called Forest Lakes. If you guys want a cool place, check out Forest Lakes. And then Gary, he's bringing up the Chubacabra. So like in the early 2000s, the Chubacabra was the equivalent of the a Mogollon monster, you know, mystery files was on it. And the Chubacabra was supposedly like this, um, they call it the goat sucker. That's why they call it Chubacabra. And, um, I guess there was like dogs and goats and, in um, cows that would basically have like two holes in its neck and some, some animal would come along and suck all its blood and leave the carcass behind. It was just sucking the blood. And then, uh, I was actually out in the desert one time and I seen a chubacabra, but it really looked like a dog with mange. That's really what it looked like. But you still see these like chubacabra kind of animals, but I think that's really what it is. It's a it's a dog with mange. I, I don't really know what ever happened to the chubacabra, but that back in the early 2000s, that was a big thing. Um, Amber says I danced and had a lot of fun in Star Valley on the outside of Payson. Yeah, skin, what's the skinwalkers? I mean, there's so many different stories out there. I actually never heard of the skinwalkers. I don't know about that one. You can run a lake in Greer near Sunrise Ski Resort. You can run a whole lake. Most of the lakes up there nearby Greer up by uh, Sunrise, I think those are like on the Native American reservation because every time I try to go out there off a beaten path, off the road around Sunrise, it's all it's all res. And they kind of look at you like, even if you try to drive out there, they'll be up there in the pickup truck being like, <laughs> you don't want to mess with those guys, man. Because once you're on the res, it's a whole, it's like a whole different country jurisdiction. So uh, I always, I don't really like going, I don't really like going off under the res, to be honest with you. I think sometimes you can, but I, I'll go over there if they invite me, but I'm saying I wouldn't go over there uninvited. So around Greer, there's a lot of res and a lot of lakes. But I think you need permission. 
obviously if you're paying for it, you probably get a permit with that payment. But I'm just saying if someone was trying to go up to the lakes up in Greer, be careful, uh, be careful up there because um, it's reservation. Those are the, uh, the, I think it's the White Mountain Apaches. It's the tribe, the White Mountain Apaches. So it is what it is, right? Z says it's two to four hundred dollars a day with fish limits. You reserve it online. Is it on the reservation or is it uh, nearby? I know that when you right when you come into Sunrise, go up there and do some skiing this this winter up at Sunrise. You could go to Snowball. You go to Sunrise. You could go to uh, Sun Valley down there in uh, Mount Lemon. Um, but Sunrise, cool skiing up there, higher elevation. They call it Mount Baldy. It's not the Mount Baldy from California. It's Mount Baldy out here. It's not even a bald mountain, really. It's got a lot of trees on it. But um, you go up there right before you turn off. There's a big lake off to the off to the, with a meadow, big lake and a meadow off to the uh, north. And I I always wanted to go out there, but I don't think you can. It lo it looks cool though. Um, it's called Bunch Tunnel River Reservoir R and Greer. Greer is Greer is cool. But the thing is, it's super small, like the little valley ravine or the area that Greer is in. I mean, it, there's not much going on in there. There's not much going on in there. And if too many people move there or something, it would just they must have zoning requirements because they keep it small. But it's really nice. It's like this little pocket of heaven right there. Um, but it burned down in the I want to say 2007 or something like that. Um, Desert Girl says, just to let you know, we are in Tonopah. Hot, dry, and hardly any rain. Tonopah, yeah, that is like, it's almost uninhabitable in Tonopah. It's on the other side of the white tanks uh, on the way towards California, just north of the Palo Verde's uh, nuclear power plant, kind of nearby Buckeye, but beyond Buckeye. The interesting thing about Tonopah was Bill Gates had a plan to build a smart city. And I don't know whatever happened to this idea. I think he was going to call it Belmont. We even talked about it on this channel when it was supposed to be coming out. It was supposed to be this new smart city called Belmont, just north of Tonopah. And they were going to do all sorts of cool stuff. And yeah, I was kind of excited for it because I like smart cities. Although they're not very popular because uh, there's an organization out there that's you that's supposedly behind it who doesn't who possibly doesn't have. I'm not saying Belmont. I'm just saying like the smart city concept, they call them the 15 minute cities. So people don't like them because they think it's a, there's a nefarious agenda behind it. But for me, having been to smart cities and been around intelligently designed cities, the concept is great uh, because everything's functional. It's more modern, uh, but if there's a nefarious agenda attached to it, that's not good. I think it was, people got, hes people hesitated about it because it's under the idea of, you'll own nothing and still be happy. So people feel like they're going to be pinched out of their homes, pinched out of their private property so that they can own nothing and still be happy. And so it got a bad rap, but I've been to smart cities like Doha, Qatar, Dubai, um, Singapore, really smart cities, very functional. And yeah, they're great. Um, whereas out here in Arizona, if I want to go anywhere around Phoenix, uh, I got to get in my car. And so there's no walkability here. And to be honest with you, that, that's why there's so many beasts out of shape Americans uh, is because they don't exercise. Because when you're in a city where you can bike, uh, jog, exercise, walk, even walking, just walking. Uh, but out here, you know, you pe people, what they do, this is the average lifestyle. I'm not knocking them. I'm just saying this is the lifestyle. What they do is they... They go, they go, they're getting their car. They go to CVS. They wait in the CVS line in the drive through. They get their prescription. They come home. They order uh, DoorDash or Amazon Fresh or something. They don't even go grocery shopping. So everything is in their car and in their house, in their car and in their house, in their car and in their house. They're not exercising. So you got a, a lot of out of shape people because of it. Whereas in a smart city or a 15 minute city, you get um, a lot of exercise. Physical activity is built into the structure. And so for me, when I'm here, I actually start to get lazy and and, and like that just in my car because I can't walk to the, I can't walk anywhere here. There's nowhere to walk. It's right smack dab in the city. 
Um, even, even when I was living in these brand new apartments up in uh, Desert Ridge, I wanted to walk around the desert, but it says no trespassing. This is state trust land. Or even when you walk in the desert, you kind of got to watch out for critters, you know, rattlesnakes, etc. cetera. Um, so it is what it is. Someone said, expect another million by 2050. I think Phoenix and Tucson are projected to have 8.5 million between the two. And they're supposed to form a, a mega city known as the Sun Corridor, I believe is what it's called. I think it's called the Sun Corridor. Phoenix and Tucson are supposed to merge at some point in time. So the, the that's where you'd want to buy the land if the, I think it's called America 2050. That's the plan. You guys can look it up. It's called America 2050. A lot of these projects get canceled, but they're going to fill in the gap between Phoenix and, and um, Tucson. They already started doing that because they started moving everything south Coolidge, they, they got Nicola building that. They got the, the factories being built out in Coolidge, heading south down into Eloy. And uh, even Casa Grande was supposed to build some major projects. So they're already talking about it, even though the projects keep getting canceled, but they keep pushing it down. Now, as far as Tucson moving north, you already know about, uh, you know, was that Rancho Palo Verdes? You also have uh, Oro Valley, you know, so Tucson's moving north. Phoenix moving south, 2050. I mean, that's more than a million people, I think. Marana, right now, no. I would not want to live in Marana. I wouldn't even want to live in Picacho Peak area. The only thing I like about Picacho Peak is in the summertime, or in the springtime, I'm sorry. It's nice. Springtime of Picacho Peak, very colorful. But summertime, Picacho Peak, anywhere around there, Casa Grande, hotter than, I mean, it's... Hotter than H-E double hockey sticks. Let's just say that. They already pretty much have it. If you look at the construction going on, uh, 12, 11, 23, there's an ungodly amount of construction going on in between Phoenix and Tucson. Yeah, there is. I mean, if you look out south of T Coolidge, where all those farms used to be, they're just like building all these mega factories, not just Nikola. There's structures going on out there, huge buildings being built. You drive by and you're like, what is that? I would even go on my map and I'd be like, what the heck is that building? What are they building? And then they have these mega factories that are mothballed. So they build these big, huge structures and then there's nothing even in there. It's just an empty factory, like a failed project. So it's like, what is going on with that? I don't know. I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> I, I, sometimes I look for you guys for answers. I, I don't know at all. That's for dang sure. Um, we need more vertical building here. Yeah, I mean, the concentration of a of, uh, city would be nice to get like one area where Phoenix could follow, Denver. If you've ever, I don't know when the last time you went to Denver was, but growing up, Denver and Phoenix were both known for having like dead downtown areas. And there was this idea in the 90s that Phoenix and Denver were going to uh, do a downtown rejuvenation program. And... So far as I'm concerned, Denver pulled it off. Phoenix did not. And you know me, I'm always one to toot Phoenix horn or or boast about Phoenix, especially when it comes to the Phoenix Suns versus the Denver Nuggets. The Broncos, Cardinals, that's not really a rivalry. But um, the Rockies and the Diamondbacks, that's a rivalry. So I'm always Diamondbacks, Suns, right? Well, Denver actually did it. They actually built a downtown area. I think it's like 18th Street or something like that. But it's very functional and livable. Whereas in downtown Phoenix, you have Roosevelt Row and Central. But it's, I hate to say it, it's not functional. And they need more indoors because in the summertime, it's a ghost town down there. No one wants to go down there in the summertime. And people are always saying, hey, man, why are you always bashing on downtown Phoenix? Well, because downtown Phoenix still has a lot of work to put in. They might even lose the Diamondbacks. They might lose the Suns to Tempe. Someone just said Tempe is blowing up. Tempe is becoming the new downtown. <laughs> Serious. And that's still like a bit, got a long ways to go. But they keep throwing up these brand new buildings and it looks great. But aside from looking really good on the, the riverfront as you're driving across Rural Road or Scottsdale Road where it meets. I mean, it looks good when you're taking a picture of the sunset or when you're flying into Phoenix. But as far as it being functional, I mean, there's not much to do down there in Tempe still. 
aside from like Mill Avenue, but it looks good. You'd, you'd almost be like, wow, all these new buildings in Tempe, they got to have some cool stuff going on. But it's all like these businesses, like Norton, um, QuickBooks or something like that. I mean, it, and, and they don't want, they don't let you go in the buildings. There's no like restaurants there and the restaurants that are there, they're kind of, they close it like from two to four. So it's like not a place to hang out. Right. I don't know. So it's like, they're building all this cool stuff, but it's not very practical for everyday living. That's the thing that bothers me. Uh, Tempe has a ton of rooftop bars says AJ. Yeah, they do. Especially like at some of the hotels, I want to say not the aloft. Is it the aloft or the West end? Um, but yeah, rooftop bars are a cool thing. We should actually do some more investigation into rooftop bars on this channel because uh, when I was in Bangkok and Dubai, I went to a few rooftop bars. I really like rooftop bars. Uh, they have uh, rooftop bars in Scottsdale at the Talking Stick Casino. So it's nice. I'm moving off grid. Y'all can have the cities. That's what uh, Sponsor <laughs> says. Yeah, that would be great. I, I always have this dream of uh, being up in, um, being up, being up there. You guys can see my lips are chapped, dry lips. I have to do something about that. It's because um, I, I I didn't have that problem when I was in the tropics, not at all. That's the thing with living in Arizona. You get dry skin. It's it's really serious. It's not just a dry desert. It's also a lot of other things. It's a dry body. Um, what do you think about Santan Valley? Is that part of Mesa? I used to live in Santan Valley. That was where I started making the channel from. And I built a house in a nice backyard and everything. And it's booming and it just keeps on booming and they're growing. And Santan Valley is like going to be the next, uh, Gilbert. Well, it's actually going to be, so Gilbert is going to turn into what it's going to get, it's going to get dated and old. And it's going to turn it into like the next Tempe. Tempe is going to replace Phoenix, downtown Phoenix. So it's like the evolution. Phoenix is going to have to level up and do something even better downtown Phoenix. But uh, most of the growth is really moving Southeast and, you know, someone would say it's moving Southwest, but yeah. Okay. I mean, aside from the Arizona Cardinals stadium, I don't know about that, but Queen Creek is going to become the new Gilbert, but better. Although the downtown area is kind of dysfunctional. I don't quite understand why they built it the way they did because they could have, they could have built it a lot more entertaining than they did. Santan Valley doesn't even have a downtown area, but it's going to have a huge population. Like I would say it's going to be around 70,000 probably in the next 10 years. That's my opinion about Santan Valley. It's growing quite crazy. The other truck stop in Ash Fork will have a hotel and restaurant. I think it will greatly improve the town, says Off Grid Living. There you go. Um we just need an uptown, downtown Phoenix to connect, and we would really have a nice downtown, I think. Yes, and then they need the rail to go right up uh, into that, and, and, and it'd be functional. And then, yeah, that would all be great if they could just connect it. I don't know why they, they, they keep building like everything, like these little pockets, and they spread them out. But they need to concentrate it and make it all like one big area, kind of like what they did in Denver. Have any of you guys been to Denver lately? Like Denver nailed it. Denver really nailed it. Phoenix did not. You know, you could make an excuse for Phoenix saying it's because of the extremely hot uh, summers, but Denver could say, well, we get extremely cold winters. So they have like a microbrewery culture out there in Denver that, and I'm actually not a fan of Denver. No, I couldn't live in Denver. I wouldn't want to live in Denver. I don't like Denver. But as far as like building a place where people come together and conjugate, and it functions as in a city should. Denver did it. Now, outside of outside of Denver, like on the outskirts in the suburbs, it's completely. What in the heck did they do? I have no idea what that is. Like the suburbs of Phoenix are better than the suburbs of Denver. I would not live in the suburbs of Denver. Talk about uh, just a miserable place to be. I don't know. The closer you get to the Rockies, the better. But you got to be a lover of snow. Denver is a mess, but downtown Denver's got it. They nailed it. Crush up the likes if you want me to keep going. We got 128. 
They're making a few new subdivisions out here off 99th Avenue and Indian School. Westgate area estate is about to go through the roof. Possible. I have to get back out to West Phoenix. West Phoenix is, it is something else. There, It's, if they can continue to expand around Westgate, that will be the best thing they can do. Not just building hotels because around Westgate, they've got a lot of nice hotels because when they do the Fiesta Bowl or they do like some big event, the Super Bowl, they get, or when the Cardinals games are in town, they do, they get, they have a lot of hotels, but they need more apartments for everyday living. And downtown Gilbert has that same problem. They built a downtown area, but they don't have parking. Well, they do have parking now, but they don't have like, condos and apartments down there and i don't understand why and they do this designers are doing this and it's i've seen it in multiple other cities i saw it in doha too in lucille and i don't understand why they build these downtown areas for walking and stuff but they don't build apartments and living not houses you wouldn't want to build houses you would build like high-rise apartments with underground or above ground parking like you know and that's how you would do it. And then that's how you create an affluent community and a neighborhood that just keeps on growing and keeps on getting better with time because people are using it. You want something to, to boom economically, you need people to use it and want to use it. And that's the thing with downtown Phoenix. They've got all this shiny stuff, but no one's using it. Tempe, same thing. You go down there. If there's not a festival, if there's not a festival going on at uh, uh, Tempe Town Lake or around there, there's no one really down there after May from like May till September, at least no one's down there. Maybe on the 4th of July, people go down there. The, the winter time on the weekends, you'll see college students down there hanging out, riding mopeds or whatever those bird scooters are bikes. That's about it. But people aren't like going to Tempe like they could. But again, it's Arizona State University. It's for college kids. It's not for adults. Although Tempe's building all these, like, I don't know what they're, why they're building all these corporate offices down there. Maybe they're trying to attract talent out of Arizona State University to work there. But yeah, Tempe traffic is terrible. I mean, it's the city designers. I want to know who they are so I could just ask them, like, what were you doing? Like you had this opportunity to do something super amazing and it just didn't work. That's where I feel like I could come in because I'm, I've been to big, massive cities around the world where I've seen amazing things happen. Look, Dubai is an amazing modern city, but it's got its problems. Like Dubai has the same kind of thing where they built Dubai Marina over here and then they built downtown like 15 miles away. And then in between is like, city but it's like doesn't make sense and um they're building business bay and they have al jadef and they have like the era and the old town but in the summertime dubai is empty really and then in the winter time it comes to life so it, it's it's something it's a project that's definitely not done but uh phoenix I, and i use dubai as an example but you have places like singapore who do a lot better asia just does it better when it comes to cities in terms of functionality, walkability. Um, that's why most Asians are thin. You go to Asia, <clears throat> there's no obesity. There's no obesity in Asia. And, uh, you know, I, I remember one time, the, the first time I ever went to Singapore or I went to China or I went to Japan, Japan has no obesity, maybe one in a hundred. Like one in a hundred people are heavy set. <clears throat> and I was thinking about it. I was like, what exactly... What exactly is that? It's so hot in here. I, I think my heat's on. Like, what is up with my heat? Why is it so hot? Um, and I was thinking about, is it the diet? Because, you know, they eat noodles and rice. Well, rice has no, like, carbohydrates or calories, really. It's a zero-carb or zero-calorie. Uh, yeah, it's 78. How do you get to 78? I never turned it on to 78. Turn that down. Um... That's the good thing about the Nest thermostat. If you don't have one, you need to get one. But they eat rice and meat. And out here, we eat a lot of breads. And uh, But the other thing was, 
every everyone's walking everywhere. Everything's so walkable. I mean, you go to Shibuya Crossing, you go to Shinjuku, Harajuku. If you guys want to see Tokyo, Osaka, go on to Island Hopper TV, my other channel. I made a 52 things to do in uh, Tokyo. There you go. I think I did like 28 things to do in Osaka. So I know because I was pounding pavement out there big time going around to things to do to make those videos. <clears throat> but that's how I know it's walkable. It's extremely walkable. And uh, people around there are always walking. You come out here, back to the cars. And I'm like, oh, man, I'm back to the cars. So I get back into the sedentary mindset, sedentary lifestyle, start packing on some weight around the waistline. And I'm like, oh, man, I got to get out of here because I'm going to get fat if I stay any longer. Because the diet, the food, the uh, the lack of mo the lack of exercise. And I hate going to gyms because they're so boring. Gyms are just boring. I used to work out all my all my 20s. I have gym, I have weights in my house, but going into a gym, I'm like, this is so boring. What am I doing in here? I'd rather be working. I did keto, man. I did keto. Keto is not for me. Um, sorry. Uh, let's see. Off grid backcountry adventures. Been watching you for a while. Definitely considering your area. Do you know anything decent available now? Uh, I can tell you being here in the Bay, the light rail is definitely bring in more riffraff. Oh, dude. Yeah, light rail. If you're from Oaktown, that's what it says right there. You're from Oaktown. You already know, man. Talk about riffraff. Oakland's got it. Yeah, sugar is a sugar. It's. I don't even think it's sugar as much. Well, sugar is bad. I mean, it's how much sugar they put into it, right? Because you need sugar. Like sugar is actually like something you need. But the problem is the high fructose corn syrup. And I was doing some research on why high fructose corn syrup is so bad. So first thing I want to know is uh, why is high fructose corn syrup so bad compared to regular sugar? Okay, so why is high fructose corn syrup so bad? Well, they have... Uh, your body, your cells cannot properly digest high fructose corn syrup. And so what is high fructose corn syrup? It's a cheaper version of sugar, granulated sugar, because uh, there's two different types of sugar. There is glucose and then there's um, fructose. So fructose is the one that's harder for your body to process because it's a processed sugar. Whereas glucose Actually, your body needs glucose. If you're lacking in glucose, because that's the problem that happened to me, is I was doing keto, but I wasn't getting enough glucose. So I had low blood sugar or something was off with my blood sugar. So I was getting like wonky in the mind. Like my head was getting like lightheaded and stuff. And I didn't know what was going on. I'm like, this is crazy. I'm doing keto. I'm doing everything I should be doing, but I feel off. Well, it was because I wasn't getting enough carbs. I wasn't getting the right carbs, the proper carbs. So I think that's one of the downsides to keto is... You still need carbs, but it needs to be the right kind of carbs, preferably uh, amount of glucose. Because anytime you do any sort of physical activity, you're going to want to have glucose in your system to burn off that, to, to give you energy. So if you're lacking glucose and you're just running off of just straight elk meat, because I know that's what you're eating, just straight elk meat, elk burgers, elk patties, and you're just eating meat only like Jordan Peterson, right? <laughs> Um, you know, Jeff, how are you going to keep busy now that you're home? Oh man. Well, I'm going to do some stuff. I'm going to go around Phoenix, check up on some things, go across Arizona a bit, see my family. And then I'll probably, uh, see what's up from there. I want to go back down to Mexico. I want to go down to Belize. That's where I'm probably headed next is Belize. I've actually never been to Belize. Last time I was down in Central America, they had they had some strict rules because of you know what C nineteen. I'll, I'll let you know guess what that was. They had the they were playing the the reindeer games because I was in El Salvador. I was like, hey, I'm in El Salvador. Let's go to Belize. Oh, Belize has some uh, paperwork uh, riffraff, and I got to get jabbed up the nose in order to prove that I'm negative to go in there. I was like, I'm good on that. I already done too many of those nose swabs. I don't need to keep poking my nose. So I was like, I'm going back to Mexico, but now, now they don't have any, uh, red tape to get in there. So I'll go down there. I'll go down to Kai Cocker or something like that. Um, th there is a balanced learning curve. Yeah. I mean, everybody's body's different. 
But that's the thing that I think is the biggest problem is the high fructose corn syrup. Now, what do I know? I'm not a doctor. I'm just testing my body out, trying to see what works and what doesn't. But I do know insulin resistance um, is a big thing right now. I think like they said, like 90% of American population is insulin resistant or pre-diabetic. It's a big thing, man. Don't I'm not giving professional health advice, by the way. I'm just telling you what I was learning about with, you know, pre-diabetes and diabetes and insulin resistance. And come to find out people who are insulin resistant can reverse it by making some adjustments in their diet. But it seemed like every time I was doing research, it was always going back to one thing, which was high fructose processed carbs. So um, Alex Jones just made an announcement. <laughs> um, John Sweet says, it's getting hard to get home insurance in those outer areas prone to fire. Where's that, John? Rex said spikes insulin. Alex Jones, he just made an announcement. Um, Deacon says, maybe I know Jeff travels around a lot. I'm sure Brian would invite him to check out his pad. But yeah, I agree. What's going on? Another thing is jobs in my field. I really don't know about competition. Um, <clears throat> what's your job? Um, as a child from the 60s, when everyone was skinny, something has changed in our diet and food. Yeah, it's the high fructose corn syrup. When did they start introducing that into the diet? Because, you know, you go on Netflix, it says sugar is bad, sugar is bad. But it's like we've been eating sugar. You eat sugar when you eat an apple. You eat sugar when you eat a citrus. You eat sugar all the time. <clears throat> There's this one dude, the, the guy who created Bulletproof Coffee. His name's Dave Osprey, right? So I follow him on Instagram. I think he's a little bit out there. He's super like, I don't know, man. He's got some good things that he says, and he's got some crazy things that he says. So I take him with a grain of salt, but he does say some interesting things. But one thing that he brought up was about vegans. I guess he did the vegan diet. He went through the whole process. You know, he calls himself a biohacker, someone who hacks the body to live longer and get uh, micronutrients and all these different things, whatever he's into. But he was saying that... uh he was on the vegan diet and he just couldn't realize why he felt so bad. He just didn't feel, he felt off. And he, he was like, why am I feeling off? I'm doing all the right things. I'm vegan. Now he only eats meat, but he's, he's like a big evangelist for carnivores. Like he wants you to eat meat, but he was saying that when you eat veggies, it actually drains your body of important nutrients. So when you eat veggies, he said it goes into your body and the veggies are actually sucking the, they're trying to survive. The veggies are still trying to survive because they're DNA programmed to like survive that way. So they suck your body of nutrients. So you're sitting here eating all these veggies thinking, yeah, I'm getting healthy. I'm doing all this good stuff. But really, he's saying that the veggies are sucking your body of nutrients. So he's saying if you want real nutrients, eat a steak. So I don't know, man. That's what I'm saying. It's There's all types of different information out there. You got the vegan saying, go vegan, go vegan, save the cows. Save the save the goat, save the lamb, all this. And then you got the carnivores saying, screw meat or screw uh, veggies. So here's what I do. When I go around the world, for example, when I was in Petra, Jordan, they have this tribe there, the, the Arabs. This is where Lawrence of Arabia was in Petra, Jordan. It's nearby. Um, it's nearby Israel or Palestine, really. Um, but down there, they, they have uh, the Bedouins, okay? So if you go down to the Arabian, De I think it's called the Arabian Desert or something like that. I don't know the exact name of it, but I was in that desert and it's completely barren. There's nothing that grows there. It's just empty of life. And out there, they don't, so because they don't have any water or they do have water, it comes out of springs and stuff. So I asked them, I said, what do you guys eat? They don't farm. So they have this belief that uh, only like certain weird people eat veggies. The only type of veggies or any type of plant they eat is a tea. So they drink a tea. It's an herb. But their whole diet consists of either milk from the goat or the camel. Or I think it's camel. Maybe it's goat. And meat. And I said, well, okay, so well, tell me this. Your ancestors or your family, how long did they live? And he said, into the 90s. 
He says, grandma was like 95. I said, she lives off of all meat diet. I said, wow, that's throwing me for a loop because back in my country, in the United States, everyone's telling me I need to go to vegan if I want to have a long life. So that was when I was kind of like, okay. Then I go out to um, Okinawa or in Japan and they're eating all this rice. Out here in America, they tell you if you eat rice, it's the most processed carb that leads to um, sugar. And so rice is really bad, according to all these Westerners. But yet over there in Japan, you've got no obesity and you've got really healthy people. And in Okinawa, they have the highest life expectancy on Earth. OK, so I'm like, oh, this isn't making much sense. So then I'm out in Italy and I'm like, in Sardinia, they they live to be over 100 also. So we're talking about people who live to be over 100. These are called centurions, people who have the long lives and they eat a lot of bread. So I'm like, OK, this is kind of crazy. You guys are eating a lot of bread in America. They're telling me, stay away from bread, stay away from meat. So we're getting wrong information. <laughs> I don't know, man. All I'm saying, hey, there's a lot of people doing this and they're not all right. So for me, the thing that I concluded was what did my ancestors eat? The people, what did my grandparents eat? That's likely a diet that I inherited. So I should probably, it's kind of like under the same concept of paleo, but I'm not going all the way back to paleo to hunter and gatherer. <laughs> and I'm not doing paleo because they, with the paleo diet, they incorporate a lot of intermittent fasting. And that works if you're really trying to lose weight. But I would not live a lifestyle based around intermittent fasting because that just doesn't work for me. Who, who, who's Timmy G? Shout out to Timmy G. Um, many people of different ethnic groups have different diets. Yeah, I mean, if you look at the Native Americans here in Arizona... There's a lot of obesity on the reservation. Well, what was their diet before McDonald's, KFC, and all these other things came through? Well, it was a whole different thing. It was like they were eating some like mammals, but what grows in the desert? That would have been what they were eating, right? Fish. Maybe in the little Colorado, there was fish. Uh, uh, maybe like some deer because deer was very plentiful. Uh, obviously, the further north you go, there were some buffaloes. I don't know if there was buffalo in, in the Four Corners, but what did the Apaches eat down here? You know? If you look at the mono and matate, where they were grinding uh, corn, squash, uh, mesquite seed. I mean, that's how they were making tortillas. Yeah. So, you know, prickly pear cactus, a fruit. There's no, what other fruits are out here? There's no bananas. There's no um, apple trees in Arizona and Phoenix. So they were living off of a diet of squash, uh, some like javelina, some deer. And, uh, and now... They eat McDonald's, totally threw off their whole uh, diet, and now they have obesity. Same thing happened to the uh, Eskimo up in Alaska. They were used to eating seal blubber and, like, whale, really, like, you know. And then all of a sudden they change their diet, and then they have a problem with obesity and diabetes. So, yeah, I mean, when you, when you try to change your diet away from what your ancestors or your family was eating, if your family raised you as vegans – that's probably closer to what you should be eating. If your family raised you eating bread and meat and potatoes, then that's probably what you should be eating, in my opinion. <laughs> um, so I said yucca, beans. Yeah, beans, man. Beans are high in fiber. Same thing happened with the Hawaiians and the Samoans. Yeah, I mean, if you go down to Hawaii, what's going on out there? I mean, the Hawaiians, what they eat? Well, they ate a lot of fish, a lot of fish. So it depends. I mean, if you're a landlocked tribe that's away from the water, like the, uh, I mean, there wasn't much water in, in the Four Corners area, Monument Valley, the, you know, there's not a lot of water. What, there is water, but it's seasonal, right? It's not like continuous water aside from the Colorado River. But, you know, there's going to be fish in the Colorado River year round. But as you're up in the plateaus, you're up in, other areas, where's the fish going to come from? I mean, if you talk about the Papago or the Ho'okam, when they lived here, Salt River was flowing through, so there was some fish. What fish are endemic or indigenous to the Salt River? You know, those are the things that I would think about if I was thinking about what my diet is or should be. 
people whose diet is feast or famine will gain weight when food is easily available. So they have storage when food is scarce. Yeah. I mean, I think we all kind of come from that background because, you know, you had the Irish potato famine. Uh, I mean, famines were a big thing up until around like the 1960s. It kind of went away. Starvation kind of went away. We don't really live in a world where starvation is ever a thing. Uh, we, uh, the American diet, we consume so much food. I mean, the portion size is sometimes just outrageous. I mean, people need a burger about that big. Sometimes they want like four patties and buns like that. And, you know, you pile on the ketchup with all that high fructose corn syrup, all the condiments with ranch. And then you eat those fries totally seasoned with salt and all sorts of different seasonings. And then you just eat a chocolate cake right after. And that's your third or fourth meal. That's probably overconsumption. So portion size is a big thing. Now we've turned into a dietary channel here, hour and 30 minutes in. What country would you move if you had to top three? Oh, this is a good question. I'll give you my top five. How about that? I could actually probably give you my top 10, but top three. Ooh, man. If I had to narrow it down to three. I really like the Philippines because I like this idea of 7,500 different islands and beachfront property on a beautiful paradise island like Robinson Crusoe. Because to me, that's where I would find you could find that in the Philippines, like Pacific Islands like that. Um, you know, you could go to Tahiti, you could go to Fiji, you could go to French Polynesia and Guam. But the thing is, it's going to be way more expensive than you can get in Philippines. So you can get the same kind of oceanfront property, beachfront property in Philippines for a lot more affordable price. So Philippines is up there. Um, Thailand just kind of hits on all cylinders. It's got uh, quality infrastructure. It's got luxury buses. It's got trains. It's got um, rooftop bars in Bangkok. It's got cosmopolitan lifestyle. It's got beautiful beaches in Koh Samui, Koh Tao, uh, Phuket, um, Krabi, you know, and it's all easily accessible for getting around. Uh, flights are like $50, $60 in the north. They've got culture. They've got the Buddhist uh, monasteries and all that or temples in like Shang Lai, Shang Rai, Shang Mai, um, Pai. They've got uh, rural living in rural Thailand and places like Buri Ram if you want to get out there and just kind of fit in with the locals. And that's the big thing for me is where I go somewhere, can I assimilate and fit in with the locals? Thailand, Philippines, I can do that. Um if I was to pick like something like India, I could, but it's not as easy. Um, also a language barrier in India. So no, India would not be it. So Philippines, Thailand. Um, the third one, if I was to go for like a European destination, I said this today to someone, Montenegro. I've been to Montenegro. It's like a, it's like a Greece a bit. I mean, I would live on the Greek islands, I assume, but that could get boring because it's an island um, or their islands. But the thing I like about the Greek islands is you could easily get from one island to another by ferry. And I think there's a ferry that connects almost all of those islands in the Aegean. There's like 30 of them, everything from Rhodes to Crete to Santorini to Mykonos to Eos to Peros, Naxos, all these different islands. Antiperos, um, you know, Milos. And I like that. I like being able to island hop like that. That's why I'm island hop, right? <laughs> um, same with the Philippines. You can easily island hop. That's 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 what I'm, that's what really excites me is the island hopping because you can go from one island and it's each island is like shifting into a new portal. It's like going into a new world. Each island is so unique to itself, um, even though it's in the same country. But uh, yes, yeah, so Greece was on there, but Montenegro comes up on my list. But that's why I want to do five. So I'll tell you some. I'll tell you another one: Costa Rica and Latin America was a place that really caught my attention, especially in the Koya Peninsula around like places like uh, Santa Teresa. We did a full Costa Rica travel guide on Island Hopper TV. You guys can watch that. But that really goes into detail about my my opinion about Costa Rica. And Costa Rica blew my dang mind. El Salvador has really come up, but it's, it's a little small. I felt like El Salvador was kind of small, but... El Salvador has got a lot of potential, especially because they're cryptocurrency friendly. They got like Bitcoin Beach, Bitcoin Mountain, and uh, they've got a ton of Bitcoin, um, which if Bitcoin ever goes up, El Salvador is sitting on a mound of Bitcoin. And so that's going to make them extremely wealthy if Bitcoin ever goes up over 100,000 to 200,000 because their profit, their um, balance sheets are going to rocket. They're going to moon. 
and they say Bitcoin could go to a million. So if Bitcoin goes to a million with the amount of Bitcoin that uh, El Salvador has, that's going to just totally transform that whole place. And the reason I say Bitcoin is because Bitcoin is digital gold. So it's a reserve currency. And it seems like it's going in that direction. So El Salvador would definitely be something that I would keep on my radar in Costa Rica. Costa Rica is not into Bitcoin. El Salvador is, but it's similar. Good weather. Bitcoin relative to what currency? Well, Bitcoin relative to uh, gold. Uh, so if you want, I can tell you why Bitcoin functions as a reserve currency or as a store of value, I should say. So it's an alternative currency to the U.S. dollar to fiat currency. Fiat currency right now is nation state backed. So you have the Chinese yuan, renminbi, you have the Japanese uh, yen, you have the uh, U.S. dollar, you have the Canadian dollar, the Aussie dollar, the euro, all these different state backed um, central banking system. Well, Bitcoin is not backed by a government, right? So it's decentralized. It's not centralized. So th just as there's a demand for stable currencies that are fiat, that are central bank related, you have Bitcoin, which is a decentralized currency that's not easily manipulated by any one nation, even though a country like uh, United States actually owns, you know, the U.S. actually is one of the biggest holders of Bitcoin. If you look at the balance sheet for the United States government, how much Bitcoin they have, they have a lot. El Salvador also has a lot. I think Bhutan also has a lot. So these are like countries that if that currency ever picks up uh, and becomes a gold standard for digital age, then it will become a big thing. Um, so is do if dollar is, what did you say? Bitcoin relative to what currency? Uh, let's see here. If dollar is involved, what are they saying? Yeah, so you, ex you go on an exchange like Coinbase and you exchange the Bitcoin for US dollars. So then you take the U.S. dollars, which is the everyday currency that's used for transactional um, activity, and you just you you so you sell. It's just like gold. If you have gold, what's the price per ounce, or price? Per, what is you go, gold goes by ounce or gram? I can't remember. It's price per ounce. So the price per ounce of gold right now is like twenty one hundred dollars, and it's got a seven trillion dollar market cap, right? So. People hold on to physical gold. They keep it in their safes. They keep it in their sock drawer. They keep it under their bed. Where They keep it in their attic. They keep it in the bank. Who knows? Cash on deposit, COD. Who knows what they're doing? But the thing with the Bitcoin, it's all digital. So it's a digital reserve currency that's capped at 21 million. It's got a like a less than $1 trillion market cap. So all Bitcoin has to do is become the digital equivalent of digital or become digital gold the equivalent of a, a reserve currency, an alternative currency to gold. I'm not saying it's going to replace gold. I'm just saying that the young people, the younger generations will want to use something like Bitcoin because they don't have to worry about storage. So storage of gold is very inconvenient. It can cost you a lot of money and you might have to wait a long time. Plus the price, it's not going to make you rich. It's just a good way to hold your money because it's a $7 trillion market cap, maybe pushing $8 trillion at this point. Whereas Bitcoin's less than a trillion. So all Bitcoin has to do is become the digital equivalent of gold to 8x. That's eight times your investment. So if it goes from less than 1 trillion to 8 trillion, that means the price is going to multiply by eight times. So if it becomes the digital equivalent of gold, that's an 8x return. So right now you're at what, 40,000 40, for one Bitcoin? So what's eight times 40? That's 200,000. But a lot of people say at that point, when it reaches the the digital the equivalent of digital gold, it will far exceed that, and that's why they give it a price projection of around a million dollars per coin. Um, you know, someone said Bitcoin just introduced us to the blockchain. That that is where the val value really is. Yeah, so I mean, the blockchain is where the real value is. That's what the bankers want. That's what the central bankers want. That whole system. So for CBDCs and all these different things. Digital currencies, they uh, a more safe uh, uh, currency, right? One of the big problems that we have right now in the world today is cybersecurity. Uh, it was just announced today that China has been hacking the heck out of the U.S. government's uh, websites and data centers, and they've got all this sensitive information. And if there, if there was ever like a blow up or a, a war or some sort of uh, disagreement between China and the United States, China would be able to pull the back door, the rug on the United States. So if the United States nuked 
or or attack China because China was attacking Taiwan. They're saying that China has a plug that they could pull on us, which would be our digital infrastructure. So any way that the United States or the world can shore up their uh, digital infrastructure, whether it be the internet, their firewalls, their internet cybersecurity, uh, then it's popular. How do you blockchain trading pigs and chickens? So there's still going to be real world assets. Uh, no one ever said real world assets will go away. Houses, homes, physical physical assets, all are still going to be there. It's still part of the economy very much. And it'll, it's just... Just like the internet became a, a layer on top of an economy, you know, back in the 90s, there was people who were sitting there saying, when someone brought up the idea of the internet, they were saying, you're the dumbest SOB ever. I can't believe you think the internet's going to become a thing and you're going to buy a website for a million dollars. You're crazy. You're going to, Jeff Bezos is crazy. He's buying, uh, building Amazon, an online bookstore. What's that guy? No, he's an idiot. There's people who said that about Jeff Bezos. And, uh, well, I don't know, were they right or were they wrong? Uh, you know, so technology happens and um, a financial technology, a fintech like Bitcoin or blockchain, it's coming. I mean, th there was people who thought the idea of going to a fiat currency, which is what we're currently in now, they thought that was crazy, right? Did they or did they not? Like when Nixon brought in the, uh, the, the U.S. dollar, the petrodollar, uh, and went away from the goldback standard, Back in 1972 at Breckenridge, not Breckenridge. Uh, what's that place in New Hampshire where they did the convention? I want to say Breckenridge. Breckenridge is in Colorado. But when they did that conference in New Hampshire and they decoupled from the the gold back standard and they went to uh, and they went to the new standard of currency, which is fiat currency, which is what we do now, which is an inflationary currency. It means it's not attached to anything. It's not backed by anything. It doesn't need to be backed by anything. So if they need, if they need to do QE, quantitative easing, hey, fire up the printers. Well, in this case, they're not firing up the printers anymore. They're just adding zeros to a spreadsheet. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, these are things that the more you know, the more prepared you can be. But even then, how can you really be prepared for things that you can't predict or it's emerging technologies? It's really hard to get your finger on the pulse, right? So anyway... This is an hour and 40 minutes in. I don't know if you guys even want to talk about Bitcoin anymore, but um, Desert Girl says New Zealand, Australia, Costa Rica. Any advice for someone moving back to AZ? My fiance and I moved to Kansas and have been here for two years. He wants to go back and get a house. Well, if I was to, it's not a, it's, it's a, I would say rent right now. It's not a good time to buy even now because. Um, I mean, you have to track interest rates. Everything works in momentums, right? So once the price starts coming down, that's not when you buy. So you have to wait for the market to uh, bottom out and then start recovering. Because once it starts recovering, it's not going to do a, a crocodile teeth where it's going to go up and then down. It could, it could when it's still finding the bottom. So it's still finding the bottom right now. We don't know if it's found the bottom, but prices will bottom and then they'll go up. And then they'll come back down again below. They'll break the they'll break the um, the bottom. They break the support level. So once we find bottom, what you're looking for is you're looking for the indicator that says prices are continuing to go up. So once you see prices going up for about six months, that means we're back in a recovery. So until we see prices going up on a six month average, and we see other indicators such as you have things like um, fundamentals. So you have charts, which are technicals. So in the technical analysis, once you see a six month sustainable growth and you have the fundamentals to back it, which would be indicators such as lower interest rates and higher demand and higher supply or demand, then you have the, the, the recipe for a recovery that's sustainable, which would mean you're getting in early to the recovery, which would be the best time to buy. What you don't want to do is catch the falling knife. The falling knife is when the market is still showing signs that it's selling off and going lower. And then so you're buying still with falling prices and you don't want to be in that situation. Um, Bretton Woods, there you go, Jay said it. What happened, man? What, what sounds like the word salad? 
rent wise then where would be the best place to rent so the best place to rent would probably I, if you want to save money um you could save money by moving out to a surprise surprise or goodyear uh you could probably save some money by moving anywhere on the west side of the valley and then as the market kind of recovers, you can move out east again. But if you want to, if I, I'm just assuming that you're looking to save money. Surprise is far, but you know, it, it, it you know, you get what you pay for. If you got big money, move to Scottsdale and just don't worry about price. Just live in Scottsdale around Old Town <laughs> or Tempe or Arcadia. Yeah, John, I hear you. Alicia says, just moved to Surprise a little over a month ago from Cali. Nice. How do you like it? All the market chart watching and indicators. It's ha it's never happened before until it does. It's still gambling. Um, so observing charts is very useful, but it's not, it's not the omni. It's not God, right? So you still have other external factors, but using a tool like chart analysis, there's a reason why Wall Street uses charts and algorithms. Wall Street kills it with hedge funds and stuff because they use charts and algorithms to make their calls. But it's not the only factor that they take into consideration. Right? So you can't say that chart and technical analysis is complete pseudoscience and hogwash. Although I, I anytime someone just leans 100% on technical TA, I'm like, bye, no way. But I give it about 33% uh, credence. I'll give it about 33%. <laughs> uh, do I plan on being in Arizona for a long time? Yeah, I mean, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, it's my home. This is where all my family lives. So we'll see. Uh, I do have these dreams and goals to be this like nomad, literally a digital nomad, I guess you could say, but more or less a nomad. And as odd as this might sound, I'm a bit of a gypsy. I know that's not the, necessarily the best word, but I feel like I'm a bit of a rolling stone. It's just what motivates me, man. I love traveling, man. Is Goodyear a good spot to rent? I thought of looking in that area last time I was in AZ. It's a good spot to rent. I mean, would I live there? I don't know. I mean, I, if I had a wife and kids and they loved it there, I'd have to stay there. <laughs> That's about all I'll say about that. Um, Clay, I remember that area was flat desert, flatlands a few years ago. Alicia says she likes surprise, different, but in a lot of good ways. Guess we came right at snowbird season, so pretty crowded right now. Yeah, it's next to Sun City, so all the seniors from Canada and wherever they're from are definitely there. You're a digital nomad, eh? That's good. Yeah, I mean, if you're a digital nomad, you don't really like having roots set up anywhere because it's like an attachment. If you ever want to just keep going, you know, it's something that's kind of holding you back, right? So AJ says, yeah, I love AZ, but I definitely will move to Northern AZ if I'm staying here longer or going back to Florida. There you go. I mean, or if you can find like some, some foothills area around Phoenix, that'd be good. Or Tucson, that'd be good. Anyways, guys, I'm going to go eat my dinner. Thanks for watching. And I'll see you guys on the next one. If anyone wants to say anything to close out, um, who doesn't like attachments? Karma. Later. See you, John. Wow, some of you guys stuck along for a, a long ride. All right, guys. See you all. Firefly. Bye-bye. First name, last name. <laughs>